Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Radio Free Mormon, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Bill. And we've got a stranger here. I thought he was going to be in the green room. I, I, I probably should. Pull, so let's just move him out. So that we, the surprise is gone. Get him out of there. We'll, and we'll add him back in here in a moment. <laughs> um, you got to forgive me. I'm going to probably be a little slow tonight. I, uh, I went to Wendy's two days ago, got myself a taco salad. It was delicious, by the way. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then a few... Uh, a few hours later, not feeling so great. And then about the last 24 hours until maybe about 2 p.m. today, um, it was 24 hours of no fun at all, no good. And uh, But I'm finally starting to kind of feel, you know, you know when, when, when food poisoning ends, um, obviously the issues that come with that, those subside eventually. But by the end of it, you're, you're so exhausted. You feel like you laid on the street and got ran over by a car. <laughs> and so I'm pretty beat up. A little touch of Monty Zuma's revenge, courtesy of Wendy's. <laughs> courtesy of Wendy's. Check out the local Wendy's near you. <laughs> A cute little red-haired pigtail girl. Who knew? Yeah, yeah. She she did something wrong with the top of that one. Maybe she should wear less pigtails and maybe you know cook them all the way or wash their hands after using the restroom or something. Yes. Hey, Bill. <laughs> I don't know if it's coming across to anybody else, but there's a little bit of a delay with your feed. Sorry about that. Um, I'm trying to record from home, and we've got much better internet now, but we may have a little bit of a glitch with it. But for the most part, I think I'll stay out of the way in this show. So if you want to kind of give us a run through of what we're going to do, and um, I will kind of back off and stay out as much as I can. Okay, and if you need to run to the restroom, we'll understand. Okay, we will do. Well, tonight is August 18th, 2021, episode 37 of Mormonism Live. The title of tonight's episode is, Why Hasn't RFM Been Excommunicated Yet? The question that's on everyone's mind. I cannot tell you how many times I have been asked that question as if I would know. But believe it or not, we're going to bring on the show tonight somebody who does know the answer to that question. And that is a member of my stake presidency. Now, I believe he's a second counselor in the state presidency. We tried for the first counselor, but he was busy. <laughs> and so all we got was the second counselor. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, can we can we bring him on now that we brought him on and threw him away? There Good. he is. Hello. Hello. Could you hear me? I could, yeah. Okay. And it's what's my intro. name? <laughs> RFM. Thank you very Good much. see you, RFM. And we have been working on that very much. This is Ben McKay. Ben McKay, you are the second counselor in the state presidency, correct? Currently, yes. And the name is spelled M-A-C-K-A-Y, correct? Correct. And it's that first little A that's going to keep you from ever being a general authority. Among other things, I'm sure. No, no. <laughs> like being on this show. Okay. <laughs> or running for political office at any time. But anyway, yes, yeah, that little A, because remember, my first companion in Japan was McKay without the little A. He was right. a grandnephew or a great grandnephew of somebody with that last name who was president of the church, the 10th president of the church, I believe. And now, believe it or not, my first missionary companion in Japan is a general authority 70. So, oh, wow. <laughs> that could have been you. You really should just take out that first day Off and you'll go places. <laughs> but ben, ben McKay is a super, super great guy as evidence first off by the fact that he's on the show second off i've known him for many many years mm -hmm. uh i wouldn't say super closely but we certainly run into each other a number of times in church related things he was a seminary teacher at least a part-time substitute seminary teacher for some of my kids back when they were seminary age and i always got rave reviews from them about ben's teaching he's a wonderful teacher he went on to become the state young men's president, and um, he did a few things there, which we'll talk about. They may be of interest. And then he finally worked his way up. <laughs> that sounds terrible. I'm sorry. To becoming uh, a member of the state presidency. 
And how long has that been? Uh, four years, four, four years and change. Now. Wow. Yeah. So you've got about six years or five years and change left? Yeah, that's what they told us at the beginning. Well, can I ask you something at the very outset, which I'm sure a lot of people who are listening would want to know? Sure. In the stake, um, are you dealing with any number of people who are going through faith crisis? You know, uh, over the last year and a half, obviously, we've been in this uh, pandemic, right? And it's been a global thing, and we've dealt with a lot of things. And so there have been issues of loneliness, anxiety, isolation. Uh, and as a result of some of that, there have been people that I think have uh, faced some doubts and questions. Uh, the, the faith crisis, uh, there have been a few members that I'm aware of uh, in the last couple of years have dealt with that. Uh, RFMU and I know a couple of other individuals uh, mutually that have gone through the last, I would say, 10 years. But it's not as widespread of, um, as one might think, I guess. And I don't know if that's, I'm not sure the reason. I don't know if that's uh, a membership or a stake, you know, those kinds of things. But I do hear about it from other stakes, relatives of mine that uh, either have gone th uh, through faith crises themselves or who live in areas maybe more concentrated. Uh, I don't know, but uh, they're just a very small number of people. Okay, well, I want to get back to that here in a second. But before I do that, I do want to outline the program so that everybody will know where we're going, including you, Ben, like we haven't talked about this before in advance. <laughs> but first off, we're going to talk about some experiences that you and I have had together, just a cluster of those. Then we're going to go into part two, which will be a lightning round, where you're going to tell us what you think are the three most positive aspects of the church and then the three most problematic aspects of the church. Mm -hmm. And we'll probably do pro con, pro con, or positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, mm -hmm. and five minutes max for each one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that'll be the lightning round part. And of course, that'll take probably about half an hour if you fill up all five minutes with each one. And then at the end, we're going to get to the money question. Why hasn't RFN been excommunicated yet? And if you're wondering why I'm putting that question at the end of tonight's interview, then you can also ask the question, why do they put the milk and the eggs at the far end of the grocery store? Fair enough? Fair enough. Sounds good. Okay. So you are a wonderful teacher. By the way, I also want to make sure I get this in, is that um, you are a man, uh, and by the way, everybody watch him because he blushes wonderfully, of incredible integrity. And I'm not going to mention any details here, but there was a legal case that happened, I don't know, seven, eight years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, it involved... A situation where Ben knew some relevant stuff. And on the other side of the V in this particular case was um, basically a family that has a reputation for making up allegations against people that cross them. And a lot of times those allegations are of a sexual nature, like child sex abuse allegations they manufacture in order to smear people. And so Ben knew something about this case. I really wasn't involved except sort of as, um, I don't know, an onlooker cheerleader. And I asked Ben if he would sign a declaration for use in this case. And this would have been a very, very easy thing for Ben to have said, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I your cause is just, but if I take up with you, I'll lose the vote of Missouri <laughs> and maybe get called, a I don't know, a pedophile on top of that. But and other people did, too, by the way. Yeah. But and especially with Ben, because he coaches, he has a, mm -hmm. a, a great uh, interest and he has for a long time coaches young people in sports. So this yeah. would have even more dramatic impact if such allegations were made. But Ben decided he would go ahead. He would do the right thing. He would sign the declaration. And when I say right thing, I mean, you know, from my point of view, it was the right thing. And I think it was from yours. And he, he stood up, he did the right thing, he signed the declaration. I don't think anything ever happened as a result, but it was mm -hmm. a very real possibility at the time. So right. I just want to commend you for that in front of everybody. You're also a wonderful person in that you are one of two people in the entire, well, church, and at least in the entire state, because there's all these people that I know in the church before right. I sort of, I don't know, become Radio Free Mormon or whatever it is that happened to me. Uh, scientists are still trying to figure that out exactly. And, but there's 
what happened is what happens with so many other people who go through a process like this, and that is all the people that they thought were their friends in the LDS church suddenly go crickets and they drop you like a hot potato. And that was certainly my experience, except for Ben, you, mm -hmm. and your uh, compadre, another fellow named Keith Wilson, who should be watching now, hopefully, if he got the link. I know he was invited, he could be on, but he decided he would leave it to you, Ben, because he did not do the right thing. <laughs> and But if you want to give a shout out to, to Keith, go ahead. I will. You know, Keith, uh, I think Keith and I both agree that it's it's a sad thing that you feel ostracized. Uh, we feel like our friendship with you doesn't there, there are no boundaries on the friendship, right? And and regardless of, of someone's philosophy or, or point of view, I think friendship can supersede uh, those kinds of situations. And and Keith is a genuinely good guy. I, I think he's he, in so many ways, in many ways, he's a, a, a much better guy than I am as far as uh, reaching out to people and and navigating difficult situations, as you know, RFM. Uh, but he's a good friend and, a, and a, another really good in uh, a man of integrity uh, for sure. I have a yeah. ton of respect for Keith. And his mom. His mom's great, too. His mom is fantastic, too. Yeah. <laughs> now she's got to watch. Anyway, uh, but you're familiar with the phenomenon I'm, I'm talking about, which yeah. is uh, people sort of having a faith crisis, maybe stopping going to church, and then mm -hmm. uh, people don't want to talk to him anymore. People in the church don't want to talk to him anymore. Why is it that you think that happens to such a large degree, Ben? You know, I've thought about this a lot, uh, partially just with our inter interactions, but also uh, I've got uh, some family members, like I, I said earlier, who have gone through similar experiences. Uh, luckily, I've got a, an extended family who has not done that and not ostracized these individuals. And so I see that and I wonder why is it that people view uh, those who go through faith crises as toxic? And I think you've used that word before, and I think you probably feel that, and other people have described the, the feeling that way. Maybe it's because uh, the people's perspectives uh, change uh, when you become sort of so, uh, so-called, uh, you've left the church or you've got a, a faith crisis or something like that. Uh, maybe they feel threatened. Maybe they feel like their testimonies might be threatened. I, I, I don't really know. Uh, it it baffles me because it goes against what I believe we're taught by the gospel, which is to love one another, which is to reach out. Uh, there's nothing that says we can't befriend and, and befriend those outside of our communities. In fact, we should be friends of those of other faiths, of other philosophies. And maybe I think that idea is so foreign because my mom's a convert. My wife's a convert. I've grown up with non-member I even hate to use that terminology. I'm sorry I did. Uh, family members of other faiths and, and, and my in-laws are absolutely fantastic people. Uh, my children have grandparents who are not LDS and they love each other and there's no problem. And so to me, this toxicity that is, you know, you describe is, is completely foreign to what I think we as members of the church should be doing. And so the only thing I can come up with is uh, maybe a feeling, a, a concern, or or feeling threatened, and I don't know why people would feel that honestly. Uh, so I, I, that's a non-answer, and I'm sorry for that, but I just I don't understand it, frankly. Okay, well, it's good enough. Good enough for me. I have my own own feeling. Uh, actually, my word isn't toxic. My word is radioactive. <laughs> that's a that's a good right. one. Yeah, yeah, it's the same idea. You know, somebody's radioactive. You don't want to go near them because you know you could uh, get uh, radioactive. What do you call it? radiation poisoning? Yeah, not to be confused yeah. with food poisoning at Wendy's, right? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, anyway, there was a time. Uh, this is a number of years ago. This gets to your being for a long time. I've noticed uh, somewhat of a nuanced member of the church, and there was an assignment. I think it was a, a joint uh, Relief Society priesthood meeting. And you're nodding. Were you in a bishopric at some point? I was the bishop for a while. Oh, sorry about that. You're, you're a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Bill was a bishop. I do, yeah. And once a bishop, always a bishop. So I guess we got two bishops and a baby here tonight. <laughs> but back then, you were you were tasked. I don't remember the exact subject, but I think it was a mandate that came down from Salt Lake City to teach a certain thing. And if it wasn't Salt Lake City, it was somewhere above. It, it was an assignment that was given to you. 
And you made a handout and you taught the lesson in such a way that it was obvious to me that you were nuancing the heck out of this subject matter that you were assigned to teach. Now, I didn't go over this with you before the show. I'm sorry to be catching you with this flat footed maybe. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Not that you're not talking about the fireside, right? You're no, not the fireside. Else. That's a different thing. Yeah, no, you have to remind me of the subject. I, uh, I, I created me. several ha handouts over the years. <laughs> I'll bet you have, but you know, you know what I'm talking about in general, right? That you're somewhat of a nuanced member of the church. I would, yes, I would probably say um, unorthodox, if that's a better nuance is a better way to put it. I, you know, I would say that probably um, some of my core beliefs, uh, people would probably use the word TBM. I know that's like a four letter word uh, to many in your audience. Um, you know, I, I do believe in the core tenets of, of the restored gospel, but I think the nuance comes in how I would apply those doctrines and principles. Uh, and we'll get to this. One of the things I do have of trouble with is sometimes the culture that exudes itself in the church that grows out of the church. And I think, you know, a lot of people trying to do the right thing, trying to see where they're at, you know, eternally, we, we sometimes create checklists and we have observable behaviors that then uh, we measure ourselves against those and we measure ourselves against each other. And that creates, I think, that creates a sort of uh, a culture that I don't like and, and agree with. And that to me, like we've talked about, goes against what I think uh, is not what we're taught in the, in the core pr principles of the gospel. Uh, and so, yeah, so as far as that nuance goes, yes, I, I don't subscribe to maybe a, as rigid a, an interpretation on some things. I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head. Um, uh, I, I tend, um, here, here's one, I tend to believe, uh, I'm not a universalist per se, but I would tend to say that, as Joseph Smith said, right, that God is more liberal in his views uh, than we are ready to accept or believe. And I think that his love and, and our heavenly parents' love extends far greater than we understand and perceive. And so uh, I, I definitely in that way probably would would say I am a nuanced believer from the from that perspective I, I wish i could come up with some better examples and maybe we'll get to those well let me come up with one okay please do <laughs> it's the one that we're going to segue to that you've mentioned before because about 10 years ago maybe or so when you were the stake young men's president you had this great idea about putting on a fireside a stake fireside for the youth that dealt with problems issues questions doubts around certain church history mm -hmm. subjects is that correct that is correct. It wasn't my idea. I can't take credit for it. It was the one of the stake presidency members at the time. And I was sort of tasked as the staking men's president and high counselor. And I'm not sure why he tasked me, <laughs> but, but you'll remember we put a but panel it was for together. the youth, right? Yeah, it was for the youth. Exactly. It was for the youth to, to bring these subjects up. I, I recognize that a lot of people, especially from my generation, uh, in, confront these issues, these challenging issues, feeling like they've never uh, heard about these things before. And so they sort of feel blindsided, right? I know that's a common theme. You feel blindsided. You feel like the church has kept these things from you. And 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 I and I can recognize and appreciate uh, feeling that way. Uh, for whatever reason, I encountered a lot of this when I was in late teens, early 20s. And so I, I didn't have that sort of reaction. But point being, uh, yes, we were tasked with this idea and, to, and we were charged with, can we identify uh, some of these difficult issues to understand and, and present them in a context that is faithful uh, uh, in, in a way that the youth wouldn't feel they'd be exposed to these issues without being blindsided by some of these issues. Uh, and so, yes, you were, you were part of that. We, we put together a panel. You put uh, together a, fan, a panel. You yeah. asked me to be on it. Why did you ask me to be on it, President McKay? Oh. Please call me Ben. <laughs> okay, President Ben. <laughs> uh, you know, I uh, your name had, had been suggested to me, and, and I had known you obviously, you know, through your kids and through a couple of. I think you'd done a seminary presentation once that I was really impressed with. That uh, was very cool, and I, I, oh, you, you did another a fireside once uh, about the Book of Enoch that I remember going to, and so. I kind of knew that you had this wealth of, of knowledge. And so you were 
someone that I thought would be great. You know, we had several other people involved as well. And so the, the goal was to create this pool of people, you know, maybe, what, what was it, eight to 10 people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that would pool our knowledge together and sort of create a, we ended up creating a packet, you know, a little, a little handout, you know, several pages long. You, you wrote some things in that. And then we, uh, the goal was to do a fireside. We got redirected a little bit, as you recall, the whole original plan was to do sort of a fire, you know, a panel with people on the stage and, mm -hmm. and you could ask questions. And then we got redirected a little bit uh, with that. And, and uh, the Stake Young Women's, Women's President and I were actually tasked to tag team uh, the fireside. And we put together a you know, presentation with the knowledge we had gleaned from the panel. Obviously, had you been up there, it would have been more entertaining, I'm sure. Uh, but apparently but, uh, there were powers that be that decided that uh, somebody needed to be exed from the presentation. <laughs> well, well, I think it wasn't. I, I don't I don't think it was specifically you. But I, I think the concern was, for whatever reason, and this is something that that perhaps goes back to what you asked me earlier about the way I approach things is there was some resistance from uh, some of the adult leaders across the state, I remember. some of the youth leaders, some of the bishopric members on on presenting this information at all. And, you know, I, I, I respect those opinions. I respect those beliefs. I respect and understand sort of where they're coming from. I just didn't agree <laughs> with those sentiments. And, and the state presidency backed us on that, right? The uh, state president at the time is a, you know, if, was and is a fantastic individual. Uh, and he was aware and, and felt necessary that we did address these things for the youth. But as you know, the, these, these sorts of issues I believe when presented in the right context um, can can uh, provide an opportunity for people to not feel blindsided. And I think that, you know, if you present them and, and present the whole history, warts and all, uh, then I think people can make their decisions and uh, not feel, again, shocked to it. So it, right. but it's also this kind of thing that an hour and a half or an hour long fireside isn't going to, you know, solve the issues but we tried right right um by the way that was interesting too in retrospect in microcosm because i remember being with you and these other people in the planning stages in the um what was it, the high council room sitting yeah. around the big table yep. Yep. and watching this play out because this is a tension that's been mm -hmm. active in the church at high levels for a long time which is um one what am I trying to say? One section, one faction, that's what I'm trying to say. One faction saying, no, we don't want to tell other members about these issues. Yeah. And then another faction saying, well, we really should because otherwise we're hiding it from them. And then when they find out about them, which they pretty much certainly are now, yeah. we're going to find out about them at some time, then they're going to feel like they're betrayed. And why were you hiding this right. from me? Yeah. And I remember dealing with some of those people who were actually there and I won't mention their names, but you know, it was very, very heated. It's at that point. It was. And it was interesting because th there's a fear, you know, around uh, some of the things that happened or, or exposing people to this. And, and I understand the fear, but I also think the fear comes from misplaced expectations. You know, take Joseph Smith, for example, if, if we expect him to be, a, a 21st century version of the perfect ideal human being called by God to restore uh, the, 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 the gospel, all of us are going to be disappointed because he wasn't perfect. He never claimed to be. And so in a way, when I, when I learned about some of these issues and sort of stepped back and looked at him as, a, as an individual, as a human being, from that perspective, seeing his flaws and all, and, and, and he didn't shy away from them. Even in the Doctrine and Covenants, his revelations, he's getting chastised by the Lord in a very public way. He, he didn't shy away from that. So, so why should we, I guess, is the way I come back, I come at it. And, and, and in my mind, understanding the flaws of an individual and how they overcome them in a way that I believe is divinely assisted, I, I think that that is strengthening to my faith rather than faith destroying. Uh, and I don't believe that we need to put these individuals on pedestals and, and how, how dare we suggest that they're less than perfect. I, I think that's damaging. Uh, and so that, that's sort of, that's, that's where I come from. And, and I think that that's what we were trying. You're right. That, that tension existed in those meetings, uh, very palpably. So let's get to, if we can, uh, mm -hmm. the fact you're a longtime listener to Radio Free Mormon, right? 
Yes, I will confess I haven't listened to all the episodes. You know, maybe I don't know repent. a quarter of them. I need to repent exactly. <laughs> okay, no, no, but you have listened, and that's the amazing thing. Not that you haven't heard all of them. There's very few people who have, but they do exist. And um, but you have listened, and so here I want to set this up because mm -hmm. this I think was was it um, April of 2017? It might have been 18. Anyway, it's a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. State conference is going on. I think uh, I was only marginally aware of that fact. But all of a sudden, and I'm glad we introduced Keith Wilson already, because I, I'm at home. I get this text from Keith Wilson, and he starts texting me about how he's in state conference. He's in the audience. You are on the podium. You are speaking to the Saturday evening session of state conference. And you are telling the audience assembled a story that you heard while listening to Radio Free Mormon. I am. I did. You know, one of the themes that I get accused of speaking a lot about whenever I have a chance to speak, either as, uh, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, I've had a chance to do that re fairly regularly. And one of the themes I get accused of speaking about a lot is n not judging others and, and being accepting and tolerant and inclusive. And so the story that, that you referred to, I thought was a great example of an individual, a well-meaning individual, I'm sure, who said some things that they shouldn't have said in that room. You'll recall, you know, I, I, I said something to the effect of, you know, that a friend of mine shared a reason for his daughter's choice to leave the church. And I told this story that when she was a, a young woman, uh, you know, there was a difficult divorce that she was the daughter of, obviously, and that one of the well-meaning young women's leaders said something to the effect with with some finality, as I recall. I should have pulled up the talk. Um, That's okay. which I, parent, remember, I remember the issue. I remember what, my part of the story. I'm sure you do. <laughs> but the point being that, you know, that, that this woman was saying, you know, this is the parent you're going to end up with and, and it's done. And that's that's your eternal destiny. And I, I really have a problem with that. Uh, First of all, we are no, we are not those who are, are the final judge of anybody. We should never make claims on who's going to get where in the celestial kingdom or whatever, or what family. And so I, I feel like these sort of speculative statements are damaging and can create exclusivity. And I'm sure obviously that's, you know, as a catalyst for your daughter to feel that uh, someone would make that judgment. Uh, and so I, I feel like this happens a lot, whether it's about commandments we feel like others aren't keeping or kind of what we talked about before, you know, when people, uh, we make assumptions about people who uh, have uh, faith crises, you know, we, we assume that there's some sort of hidden sin and, and that's not fair to, to make that judgment call at all. And so anytime my point in the talk, what, and I thought your story was relevant, was that sort of theme of we shouldn't be making these statements. We shouldn't be uh, ass making assumptions. But but in reality, all, all of us are going through crises of our own, uh, regardless of what we think. And we should be strengthening each other, not making these sorts of statements that could be damaging. By the way, Ben, can I just, um, I have mentioned this story in prior uh, episodes, maybe once, maybe more than once. Let me go ahead and just synopsize it here so everybody knows what the heck it is we're talking about Please, I, okay. I obviously i have because that's where you heard it was on a radio free mormon show anyway anyway it has to do with one of my three daughters who grew up um she moved to utah with her mom my first wife right so when she was younger and she ended up not staying in the church and it was sometime afterward i finally just asked her you know what happened why is you don't go to church anymore and she told me the story which is this so her mom married to me, right? We've got this, these two kids. She's one of them. Divorces me, goes and gets married to this other guy. And then they have a couple of daughters, right? So these are my daughter's half sisters. Mm -hmm. But the parents, my first ex-wife and the new husband, right? Never get sealed in the temple. So they're in young women's one day and in, in, I don't know, she's 16 or 17 and this yeah. situation comes up and the teacher lets her know that, well, under those facts, her two half sisters are actually, uh, you know, I am 
their father, to quote Darth Vader. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that I'm their father in the eternities because they're sealed to me. And so she was very, very uh, upset by this and went and asked somebody higher in authority and it was confirmed for them. And actually, I looked it up at the time and it was in the church handbook that that was the policy of the church. So um, then I, I told that story on the air. You heard it and you went and told it. And then I found out that you told it in state conference. And I've got to tell you, that delighted me no end <laughs> to know that a member of the state presidency was repeating for an audience at state conference a story he had heard while listening to radio framework. Indeed, I should have given you a little bit more direct shout out, but you're right. It, I thought it was a good story. It's, and, and again, it goes against the theme I was trying to develop too, is this idea of, ex, you know, this idea of being inclusive. I, as you know, I coach soccer. My son and I happened to go to a tournament in Las Vegas and uh, I had to end up coaching on a, a Sunday morning just because the way the schedule worked out and we couldn't get to a sacrament meeting, uh, uh, without, we had, we had to go straight to the sacrament. Otherwise, we're going to be late. So we came, you know, full coaching gear. My son and uh, one of his uh, non-LDS teammates came with us, and uh, we're just walking in with t-shirts and shorts and, and those kinds of things. And it was it was an ideal situation. It was the exact it's the exact scenario that I had hoped, you know, that I want to see more in the, in the church, which I, I talked about in this talk, which is this welcoming attitude and. There was no question about, you know, oh, do you need a tie or here, let me get your white shirt or what are you doing here? It was complete, you know, a, a very multi-ethnic ward. It was, it was, anyways, fantastic. And so, again, this theme that I've, I've talked a lot about, they feel pretty passionately about. If, I, I would never want anything like what your daughter experienced to happen to anyone else. Uh, I've got three daughters myself, and so I can certainly relate to, to and a son uh, to to a parent who who would be very upset by that being taught. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to move on to the next thing, which is. Can I can say a couple things, Arvin. Oh, please do. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take off my camera so at least people can maybe hear me a little better. Um, I, I don't want to get into a debate, Ben. I really appreciate mm -hmm. your softness and your uh, demeanor in approaching people who have questions. I, I want to make points that I think you would agree with. So at least I would represent the audience and some of their thoughts as you were talking about things. Yeah. You said earlier, I don't really get why some Mormons distance themselves from people who lose their testimonies or back away from the church. But I think you would acknowledge that in the correlated curriculum, we really don't have any good stories about people who leave, right? We talk about Thomas Marsh, Simon's writer, we don't really tell Oliver Cowdery or Whitmer's story. We badmouth Emma a little bit. It, you would at least acknowledge that in the church curriculum, all we have are unhealthy stories about why people leave. And we don't really give people the real reasons why people often step away. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Uh and, and I probably would say, I wish we did a better job. Uh, yeah. I'm a big fan of Emma Smith, uh, having done my homework, I guess. And, and I guess I've made sure that my kids and, and the way we teach the gospel in the home uh, identifies those things. But you're right. The, I feel like sometimes the, the curriculum committee is in a no-win situation, right? I mean, they've got to create a curriculum for the entire globe. Uh, and it's not going to meet everybody's needs. Uh, hopefully, it's changing. Right. Ho hopefully we can yeah. get some more uh, more stories like what you're talking about. It'd be great to hear more about Oliver Cowdery yeah. and, and David Witt and Martin Harris. You know, I, I, just prepare, I think that's a fair point, Bill. I just think we far too often make the folks who stay in sound better than they are. And we make the folks who leave sound worse than they are. And we don't really tell the reason. Thomas Marsh, for instance, didn't necessarily leave over Milk and Springs and Simon's writer didn't leave because his name was spelled wrong. Um those are really simplified ways of telling a story about why someone stepped away from the perceived gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and as you're acknowledging, maybe it's more complex than that, and maybe we're not doing a very good job of giving believers a healthy narrative of people who leave. In fact, when Uchtdorf stood up and said it's not as simple as they're lazy or they want to sin, that really was the very first time and the only time since where I've heard a church leader essentially stand up for the people who have left and represent them more fairly. And then, in, in, again, maybe 
Maybe it's the reason, maybe it's not, but he didn't stay in the first presidency much longer. The other thing I wanted to note was you mentioned fallibility and infallibility. I, I agree with you. We can't expect anybody to be perfect, but I also would hope you would acknowledge there has to be some sort of line. If if the critics are right about everything, if if the data leans in their favor on almost every issue, which I believe it does, but again, I don't want to debate that here. If the data is in the favor of the critic on all of these issues, whether it is or isn't, just hypothetically it is, the argument about fallibility and infallibility isn't sufficient, right? Like if the book of Abraham is as the critics say it is, if if Joseph Smith's folk magic was some kind of scam to get people out of money early on, like there is a line, like we can allow our prophets to make mistakes. Maybe President Nelson, for instance, embellishing a story about his flight isn't that big of a deal, but I think the critics' argument is much more serious than that. And I would hope you would at least acknowledge, like, if we're going to decide what's real and what isn't, what's true, there can't be no line at all. People can't just have all bad behaviors and still be prophets. There has to be some degree of those men being something different than the rest of us. You're, you garble a little bit, but I think I understood the point. Um, yes, I would agree. There has to, just like a temple recommend, right? I mean, that's sort of a standard by which we uh, demonstrate a certain commitment to ideals and behaviors, right? I mean, you can't just go and knock on the door of the temple and let you in. And so I, I agree with you. There needs to be some sort of line, some sort of standard. Um, does that make the, uh, an individual called to a, a prophetic position better than we are? I, I guess that's a matter of interpretation. And, and I understand what you're saying as far as you know, the hypothetical evidence uh, leaning so far one way that, that uh, you have to arrive at that conclusion. Uh, I appreciate you not necessarily wanting to debate that. I don't think that's the point of our discussion here. But I, I, so, so I, would, I, would, I would acknowledge, yes, we do want to have expectations or some sort of line that, that we can be confident as individuals that they are people at least somewhat worthy of emulation, right? If, if a prophet is called to uh, represent the Savior Jesus Christ and, and called to speak for him, uh, then yeah, I, I think it's fair to have some sort of line, as, as you call it. Uh, you know, looking back in history is always a tough thing, right? Because we have to go on the evidence that we can see and, and read and so I, I guess I would say that there is a lot more, it's, it's, more, it's more complicated than um, just making a sort of judgment call on, on where that line is. And I think different people are going to draw that line in different places, right? And I, yeah. I, who am I to say, oh, your line's wrong, right? I, I don't think that's fair of me to say. And I would hope that others would say the same to me, you know, that, uh, well, I can't accept or I can't believe that you would think, you know, Joseph Smith could be a prophet with you. You know all this stuff, you know, how could you? And so I would think that we could have that mutual respect and understanding despite maybe looking at things a little bit differently. But yeah, to, to answer your question, I do acknowledge that there, there should be some expectation. I mean, if President Uchtdorf, who I'm, I'm a big fan of his, you know, suddenly went off the deep end, of course, you know, there would be something that would make me question his, his, uh, his prophetic role. So I just, I just often think that the argument of fallibility is too far because mm -hmm. I think what the, critic person with doubts is struggling with is more than just somebody embellishing a story or more than just somebody, you know, the little things that we all do wrong every day. I think the argument from the critic is way more serious and bigger than that. And I just want to essentially give them voice that that's the case that is more serious than just bullshit. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, you know, I, I read uh, a book by David Osler called Bridges Ministering to Those Who Question. A shout Great out book. to that book. I, I think yeah. everybody, everybody in the church should read it because these are I, I acknowledge that there are real concerns and real issues and, and real. I, I can understand you know, what you're describing. And I think it's fair to give those individuals voice. I, I don't mean to minimize their concerns by saying you know, use it, bring up the fallibility. Please don't interpret my statement that way, uh, because I do acknowledge that there are things that are hard to swallow. You know, and, and that's that's fair to say. And, and so I think as people go through those journeys, 
you know, some people come out of those journeys, uh, end up outside uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Some go through those journeys and remain inside. And, and those individuals who go on their you know journeys, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say, I, I don't think it's fair for us to say one is right and one is wrong. You know, there are journey, people who journey out and back in. Uh, you know, so to, to your point, I think I, I don't want to minimize the concerns and I hope I didn't yeah. come across that way. Bill, Thank so you. I appreciate you clarifying that. Thank you, my friend. And I guess that at a minimum, we would all agree that no matter what else, uh, a person who uh, represents God would have to be trustworthy. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not pursuing that. Okay, you're not painting. <laughs> just the corner, saying whatever right? they say. We gotta be no. We gotta be able to rely on it um, if they're if they're claiming to speak for God. Yeah. So, but now I want to get to the lightning round. Yeah. With you, Ben McKay, because I didn't think it'd be fair to just talk about three things that you think are problematic with the church without talking about three things that you think are positive, because I think there are positive things about the church. And we'll go first off positive. We may make, make it three minutes and three minutes instead of five minutes, but yeah. we'll see how this goes. Let no me problem. get my my watch off here okay and first positive thing go so the first thing i uh, you asked me about this is i i really the doctrine that encompasses our divine identity right is is humans who have an eternal potential uh through heavenly parents right we have this destiny to rejoin them in our families in eternity uh the, you know that's the plan of happiness or plan of salvation that resonates with me always has uh, i believe strongly that that brings purpose and rip and riches our lives, uh, again, I, I having non-LDS family members, uh, I'm not saying that we have exclusivity on that uh, idea, but I do believe that we do have an eternal destiny. And that, that resonates with me. I think, you know, knowing that we have heavenly parents, and I, I know you guys have talked about how we don't talk about heavenly mother enough. I, I would agree with that. Um, but just the fact that we do understand that we have heavenly parents and, and a savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who is our advocate, uh, that gives us eternal potential. Uh, I, I really don't believe in sort of the parochial or colloquial interpretation of those things, as you and I have talked, RFM. Are you talking uh, about the dominant narrative? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what? I don't know if it's the dominant narrative, but maybe in some <laughs> circles, you know, uh, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to, to the, the parochial idea of clouds or a planet or whatnot. I think it's a lot more collaborative. You know, we're supposed to be joint heirs. Uh, with the savior and, and and live the kind of life that an exalted being lives and and maybe it's the science fiction fantasy fan in me you know who loves to think of of those kinds of things and and uh, has a great imagination because of uh you know star wars star Trek, whatever you know I, I i sort of tend to think in in that perspective you know the idea of of a universal existence sounds pretty appealing to me and so i i think that that plan of happiness can can give and enrich uh our lives and our family relationships and the relationships we can build with our community. Because I do believe we're all brothers and sisters on this planet. There were some times, oh, go ahead. Uh, that'll do. There were some times when I would uh, start to get concerned that exaltation in the celestial kingdom was really just sitting and watching an endless loop of general conference. <laughs> Did you ever have that idea? Does that concern you at all? I know it kind of sobered me right up. <laughs> no, I never imagined it like that. <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I do think that we have this limited perception, right? And and we cannot comprehend eternity. Our minds just aren't wired that way. We, we live in a temporal timeline that's linear. We can't comprehend anything outside that. And to limit God's power or what he is his and, and, and our Heavenly Mother's, uh, what their existence is like to what we can conceive of or perceive, I think is, is hubris from humanity. And so I tend to think that it's way bigger and way of, way beyond what we can comprehend okay so but did i hear did i understand you correctly when you said is it a planet for ben or no planet for ben are you going to get a planet I, I don't think it works that way so i don't know no <laughs> no they got this huge planet vending machine up in the celestial kingdom i understand <laughs> you just punch what you want and it comes out is that how it works <laughs> i'm not sure what the, the token is that you have to put in but you yeah, get those I, in the I, temple i am I understand. Well, I, I wouldn't say it that way. I don't like I the said, tokens. I really, oh, the tokens. It's a pun. <laughs> Got it. I'm reduced to puns now. I was still thinking vending machine. I was like, there's <laughs> vending machines in the temple. Wait, I've missed that this whole time. <laughs> okay, so that's the first thing. Very yeah. good. Now, first yeah. negative, problematic, 
uh, issue related to the church go? Well, let me let me talk about the doctrine of plural marriage that has just never never sat well with me. Uh, and this maybe is the romantic in me. I don't know. My wife probably wouldn't say I'm super romantic, but I try. Uh, but you know, I th that's always just 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 bothered me, and I've had to just shelve that and accept that that's something I don't understand. And and I separate that from the practice of plural marriage. You know, the doctrine is different, and the doctrine of of a of a man having more than one wife. I, I, you know, my wife uh, is my best friend. We've been married for 20, 24 years. Uh, and so our, our goal is, is to have that eternal relationship together. And so I cannot fathom, uh, I, I just doesn't compute in my brain how that a, a plural marriage would work. And so that's one of those things that I struggle with, but have just, I, I can simplify this for you. Okay. It's just like your marriage, like you have it now times two. It's very uh, easy, actually. <laughs> I guess. I guess the addition is easy. It just doesn't. It's the calculus, I guess, that I don't wait, understand. <laughs> wait till you get to the multiplication. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, if Russell, if President Nelson were to contact you and say, uh, "President McKay, a special calling from God, direct to you from me, on whom you can trust. Remember, I'm trustworthy. Uh, that you got to take another wife. What do you do?" Uh, that's a that's a great question. I don't know how to answer that um, right now. I don't know that I could accept that invitation. Uh, I'd have to do a lot of soul searching and praying and come to the conclusion myself that that's what I was supposed to do. But it would require a it would require more than just a thought coming into my head. Let me tell you that. Oh, this is a phone call from Salt Lake. <laughs> well, I mean, my own confirmation. I need some real uh, revelation for that one. But you know, it's it's a uh, that's a tough question. You know, because I do believe in, in following uh, our, our, our leaders, I, I do subscribe to the notion that they have our, you know, they, they have our best interests. I know that's debatable and we don't need to go into the particulars of that. But uh, I, I do believe that, that, that it's, I sustain, I guess I should say, President Nelson. Uh, I don't think he'd make that phone call. So I get that caveat. But mm -hmm. <laughs> if he did, that's an interesting hypothetical. But what I'm hearing you say is you sustain him, but only so far. That would be a tough one. I, I can confess that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't resist. No, Somebody no, that's that's, that, that's a fair hypothetical question to, to get at sort of where I'm at. And I think, uh, like I said, that'd be a tough one. Okay. But you talked about uh, the practice of it not being as problematic to you as the doctrine itself. Did I understand that correctly? Well, that's that's if we go into some of the next, we'll go two two troubling aspects in a row here, huh? So, oh. so there are some priests, you know, there are obviously some problematic aspects of, of church history. The practice of plural marriage is one of those in the, in the respect that there, there are some, there, there are some problems with, with, with how it was implemented. And, and part of me uh, recognizes that a, we don't have all the records. We don't really know how it all went down. I mean, it, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of uh, testimonials and, and people that have written things and firsthand uh, evidence. I've read a lot of books about plural marriage, because again, this is one of those things that I just struggled with, you know, uh, and so I, I don't I wouldn't say that I don't have a problem with the practice of plural marriage. I would say that I am I, I am more forgiving for those who were called upon to implement it without an instruction manual. And I, I am forgiving for those who tried to do the best they could under very difficult circumstances. I would never want to be in their shoes. Uh, and I know all of the problems with it, with the underage, you know, I, I understand that and I've read all about it. So I, I, I get that, that that's a, a huge issue. So Can I don't I want to minimize question, that. Yeah, ben, please go ahead. Um, and I asked this to people because I think it gets right to the heart of the matter. You, so you understand the history with Joseph Smith and the 14 year olds, 15 year olds, 16 year olds, a lot of them living in the home with Joseph Smith, working yeah. as a maid or being cared for as essentially a foster daughter while dad's on a mission and mom's passed away. And I don't I don't mean to play gotcha, but I, I want to get to like the heart of it. Would you trust if you're back in 1837, 1842, would you, knowing what you know now, would you trust Joseph Smith to have your daughter work in his home with him? This is like RFM's question. <laughs> I'm just, I'm curious because, you know, I think once bill, you know the data, it really becomes difficult to trust your own kid in that house. You know, Bill, I think that's a fair question. You know, 
especially looking back at it, right? We have information, we have data, we have a different paradigm, we have a different perspective uh, than existed 200 years ago. I, I'm not trying to excuse past behavior by calling presentism, right? Don't get me wrong. Uh, and that's a difficult question, especially having three daughters. Uh, and, and I don't know how to answer that. I, you know, I, I, there is so much about Joseph Smith that I admire, uh, as far as what he, what he, he did represent, there are positive things that, 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 that have strengthened my faith in his role. And, and so I, I, I feel like you, your audience is going to say, I'm just punting on this, but, but I don't know how to answer that. Just like what if, you know, if president Nelson called me on the phone, I pro, pro, me and 21st century Ben, I would probably struggle with it. Um, and I think that's a fair question. But again, I think we look back and we have accounts, we have the data that we have, and 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 we have to make those conclusions, right, based on the, the data set that we understand. And I, I do think there were, I think it was more complicated than that. At least I hope it is, right? That there were more complex nuances to those stories. On the on the on the outside, I totally get what you're saying. It, it looks bad. The optics are bad. Uh, and so I, I hope that's not a cop out bill. <laughs> I, well, I, a, a little bit only because I think deep down your answer would be no. If he comes to you and he goes, look, you know, what, what's your, what's your daughter's name? One of your daughter's names. Oh, I got to protect the innocent. <laughs> well, I guess, well, let's just you can use mine. Your, you have a daughter named Sylvia. Jenny. Okay? Let's just make it up. Uh, you have a daughter named Jenny and the prophet Joseph Smith comes to you and says, I'd like Jenny to work on Tuesdays through Thursdays in my home doing chores around our house, helping Emma out. I think knowing what we know now, I couldn't let my kid be in that house and take the chance that that happens. Yeah. And that, and that's a fair conclusion. I'm not saying that's not a fair conclusion. You know, I th you know, if you look at the totality of his, his plural marriages and, and the estimates, right. Anyway, between 27 and what 40 something I've read Compton's book and others. And, and if you look at the percentages you know, th those were the exceptions rather than the rule. I'm not excusing it, right? But not every, that didn't happen to every person who went in there. And so, um, again, I, I understand that I'm, I'm copying out a little bit because I, I, I guess my, I, I guess I would answer it this way. I, I just think there's more to it. I think there's more that we don't know, we don't understand, and we're looking at it from our, our lenses. And, and based on the evidence that we have, I think your conclusion is a fair one. Um, but seems risky. It seems risky, but I think from a faithful perspective, if you take in, you know, if we were there in Nauvoo and, and we were living and we had the full picture of what was going on, maybe we would feel differently. I don't know. Maybe. A lot so of people anyway. a lot, yeah. And I, I, I'm just glad that you're here, Ben. You're very kind to take the questions. You can answer it any way you want. Bill is super. He's representing the listeners and I appreciate him as well. And I think you've answered that as best as you can. I would say that about the presentism part and the lenses, I think it's pretty clear that back in the 1830s and 1840s when this was going on, that uh, it was pretty much understood by all concerned that this was not something that was going to be acceptable by the broader community, even within the church, because only a small percentage of people in the church knew that this was going on. And that's why they kept it so, so secret, right? Yeah. If there hadn't been a problem, then it wouldn't have been a secret and everybody would have known about it. Um, but having said that about plural marriage and that being your first con, let's go to your second pro. Second pro. Let me pull up my notes here. Oh, I, you know, I, I this goes back to sort of a, a model of what we can become. I, I do believe that the restored gospel expands our understanding of the character and mission of, of Jesus Christ and as a model of who we can become. You know, there, there's a lot of Patrick Mason, I, who I know has been on one of your shows, I think one of the podcasts, you know, he, he wrote the book Restoration, God's Call of the 21st Century World or something like that. Uh, I've, another fantastic book. Here I'm giving all these plugs, these great books. Uh, he talked about particularism and the things that the restored gospel can offer the world. And he cited one of those things. And, and I agree with this, this expanded understanding of the Savior's atonement uh, for us and the grace that he offers uh, those who, who want to follow him. And, and, and there, are, there are nuances that we learn from Restoration Scripture, the Doctrine and Covenants, Alma, uh, the Book of Mormon, rather, uh, you know, even the Pearl Great Price, you know, the idea of, of suffering pain to save us, of being our advocate, uh, of, of Christ paying not just for sin, but understanding our, our pains, our sufferings, our uh, illnesses, 
you know, there's a, there's a really cool scripture that I, I like uh, in, in second Nephi that talks about, you know, the, the Lord's atonement um, transcending age and gender. And it's a little bit of a nuance there on, on, you know, he talks about, you know, black and white, young and old, male and female, you know, so it's an interesting way of looking at it from, from our 21st century lens that we can in, 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 in infer that, 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 that despite Jesus Christ being a male and, and a relatively young one, uh, when he went through the atonement, you know, his, that experience allowed him to comprehend every person on the planet who ever has lived. And so, or, and then other planets as well. Again, the sci-fi fan in me loves the idea of, you know, the Lord of the universe. And so that, uh, that resonates with me. And so for me, I believe that that, that can give people hope. Uh, you know, I served a mission in Uruguay. Uh, one of my oldest daughters served a mission in the Philippines and both of us, I've got a, a daughter currently serving in Colorado and and we, you know, we, my daughter who served in the Philippines and, and I bonded over some of the experiences of just people who have real temporal struggles and challenges and, and, and the, the, the idea of a savior and someone who comprehends their struggles beyond what I as a North American could, that, that's where, that's where I made connections with people. And it wasn't me being a, you know, white North American male. It, it was this idea of, of Jesus Christ who could relate to everybody. And so to me, that's a great thing, a great positive uh, about the restored gospel. Mm. Can I ask you a question? And this is going to sound tongue in cheek. Okay. I got to get the Groucho Marx reference out of the way first. You go Uruguay and I'll go mine. Perfect. But, but, be, but, uh, so under that heading, uh, do you think that Jesus thing can understand a person who, uh, like me studies church history and Mormonism to the point where, um, he or she, in this case, it's a he, uh, becomes disaffected with the institution and then sort of uh, goes somewhere else. Can Jesus understand that too? I, yeah, I believe so. I, I believe that he can comprehend that for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, you've talked in, in some of your podcasts too about how he was sort of a, a rebel in a way against the religious institution of his day. So maybe he understands you more than more than you think, <laughs> you know, being able to sort of sort of uh, point out where some of the things needed to change. And so I, I, I view us all on a journey. You know, I, I, I really think that our our journey to become like him goes through different phases and different roads and different paths. And uh, I've got an aunt uh, who hasn't who is a fantastic individual. She is one of the most charitable people I know. Uh, and I, There's a butt coming at the end of this, isn't there? No, there isn't. <laughs> I was going to say, and. <laughs> oh, okay. And instead of butt. That's what and I fully believe that the Savior understands her journey and why she chose to make the choices she did and, and step away from the church. And it goes back to what you're talking about, just sort of this disillusionment with the institution. And no matter how organized an institution may be if if the savior isn't here to run it himself it's going to create friction and f problems because he is relying on imperfect individuals to run it and so i i, I think he totally uh, gets your journey did i answer the question okay oh i think so i think you did great by the way um isn't that the whole idea of having a prophet on the, the face of the earth at the head of the church is that that is Jesus's mouthpiece. So he can run the church the way he wants to. I mean, you that's know, what I heard growing up. <laughs> that's a great question. I wish it were that easy. Right. I, I think the precedent that we learn about in the scriptures is, and even church history, right. Is that, that there's an allowance for uh, people to work through the, the individuals that they are. I, I think back to, uh, I'm going to relate this in a second, but I think back to Moses, right? He records this idea of seeing a burning bush. Well, I highly doubt there was any flame in the bush. It was probably light. And we would describe that as photons and wavelengths of light, right? Well, he couldn't comprehend that. And so, you know, you know the Savior has to work within the cultural context in the, in the Milo. Did I say that word right? Milieu. Milieu. Milieu, uh, milieu of the prophet. Of the, <laughs> has to work through that milieu, right? The The and trying to communicate with someone outside of that paradigm just doesn't work. And so, unfortunately, I, I think that President Uchtdorf or Elder Uchtdorf made this 
statement in that talk that you referenced earlier in general conference where he had acknowledged mistakes had been made in the past. And, you know, if, if God were to come in and, and just correct everything, then I don't think that's the plan he set up for us. That's the other guy's plan, right? That uh, doesn't allow for us to have, ha have uh, free and moral agency. And so, you know, there's a spectrum, right? There's a spectrum of, of God being not involved. And then there's a spectrum of God, you know, making every green light that, uh, you need to, to be green for you that he's going to make it happen. And, and I think there's some, some place in the middle where we can find comfort that there is a prophet that guides us, but he's not going to puppet master us. That I feel, I'm feeling like Jesus could up his communication skills a little. Fair point. <laughs> I, I, I said, you know, I, I mean, he's only God. Right. <laughs> well, you know, that's a, that's a great point. You know, I, and I, I don't want to digress, and I'll take 30 seconds here on this. I, I, I do feel like I have felt in, in life in the past where I have felt um, left to my own devices when, when important decisions faced me. In those, in those times when I felt sort of, you know, hey, where, where's the answer to the revelation that I was promised when I was baptized and got the gift of the Holy Ghost? My going through those experiences, I have found that I've had to work through things and learn things on my own that I otherwise wouldn't have. And, and, and looking back, I can see the absence of communication sometimes is a blessing that has helped me learn. Uh, you know, I think Mother Teresa describes that, you know, she had these experiences early on in her life. And there was this period of darkness, this dark night of the soul. And for her, it lasted a long time. You know, I'd, I've been through stretches like that. But is that a, an absence of God's communication or is that him asking me or, or allowing me to decide how much I, I want to follow him and, and trying to become like him. You know, we're not going to be puppets in the next life, right? We've got to learn how to make these decisions. And so I sort of look at it as there's these, there's these snippets of, of revelation and guidance that we get to help us learn how to make those decisions as he would. Uh, anyway, that's sort of how I look at it. Fair enough. That was more than 30 seconds. Sorry. No, no, no. That's okay. Cause it's my fault. So let's go to your second. Uh, we've gone to first pro about the eternal family or, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, negative plural marriage. Uh, second positive was about, um, uh, the, excuse me, I did pay attention, but my notes are too scratchy and so expands our understanding Yeah, of the savior and his role. Yeah. Of the savior and his role. And now your second negative, sir. We sort of covered that with the practice of, of plural marriage, but I can throw in just ideas like the the the, the priesthood uh, ban and the Book of Abraham, the production. You know, Bill alluded to that earlier, and I and I, I understand that that. Can we I, just I go with priesthood ban right now? Because I think yeah. uh, Abraham, the Book of Abraham, is your third negative. Yeah, you know that, that, that's that's fair. The, the priesthood ban is something uh, that was difficult to understand. Uh, Do you, you understand know, it? Do you feel you understand it? No. <laughs> okay. However, I will say that, and I'm sure this has been brought up, and and you've probably dealt with this. You know, there there is the precedent of of the gospel when the Savior came being preached only to the Israelites, and there was an ethnic limitation, and Peter had to receive a revelation to teach the Gentiles. You, you know, there's also the idea of, so, so I, I I could have put that in my head, right? Um, the other piece is. Uh, there's a pragmatic aspect in some respects, uh, you know, the, the, part of the reason the church members, aside from the, you know, the new religion and the new doctrines that were, were promoted in Missouri, you know, part of the, the, the challenge in Missouri was related to many of the, these early saints views, uh, anti-slavery views. And so, you know, Brigham Young was a, certainly a pragmatist, if anything, right? Uh, and, in some respects, I can see how uh, you know, uh, implementing that ban, that's not even the right word, but allowing that ban to exist was drawing a line somewhere uh, that was in line with some attitudes in society. And I, I know we want our prophets to be better than that. And so it's interesting to me that it's incongruent. What happened in Utah was incongruent with what, the way Joseph Smith approached the issue. Uh, and so a lot of people want to throw Brigham Young out of the bus. I get that. You know, I think uh, I've read a lot about him too. And so I have a lot of, you know, there's a nuanced respect that, for him. Right. Um, anyway, the point being, I don't understand it, but I, I guess 
And I don't understand why it took so long. You know, you and I talked, I think when we were doing that, uh, um, the fireside, you know, the, the book, David O. McKay and the rise of modern Mormonism, how, uh, there was someone that recalled that, you know, uh, David O. McKay, uh, you, you know, saying that it just wasn't time, you know, and, and, and that that story was told, I think, second or third hand years later. And so, that, you know, there's a question on how accurate that may have been. But so I don't understand it, but I can sort of as I as I try and work through it in my head, uh, I have to sh you know put that as something that I don't understand, that I have to have faith that it wasn't time. You know, there's a an NBA former NBA player, basketball player named Thurl Bailey, who played for the Utah Jazz, my favorite NBA team. Uh, and you know, he, he joined the church and that was a sticking point for him. And, and he had to overcome that. And he tells the story that, you know, he's living in Italy and the mission president came and visited him and just said, you know, it wasn't time. Those are all, I don't think any one of the things I just shared is going to convince anyone who has an issue with this, that I understand it or, or, or to justify it. I, I think I look at those things are things that make me consider, well, you know, those are, those are thoughts to understand and, and, and try and, and accept what happened. I, I do hope that that, you know, it's almost what 30, I can't do the math, 33 years ago. No, it was 1978. 40, 43 years ago, <laughs> yeah. 43 years ago. Um, I, I would like to think that our current membership is moving past that and that there we can eliminate any any semblance of racism going forward uh, i would love I, I did like appreciate president nelson's was it president nelson's talk about racism and condemning that i know president hinckley dealt with that years ago but I, I would it would be great to hear more of that so that we can create this inclusive community because there is no difference between ethnicities uh you know, as far as in the eyes of God. And so anyway, I, I feel like I'm just rambling at this point, but hopefully that conveys the thinking that I go through. I think so. So let me pick up on the few things that you said, and let me see if I'm understanding you correctly, because there are two main ways of viewing this. The first is, hey, God did it. It's God's priesthood. He can give it to whoever he wants in the story case closed. Who are we to question? And the second thing is really God wasn't involved in this uh, he may have been involved with Joseph Smith and his open attitude toward black people joining the church, getting the priesthood, uh, serving in positions of leadership. And then that changed and God had nothing to do with this. This was a social construct based upon the inherent racism of certain leaders of the church that existed for 126 years between 1852 and 1978, if I did my math right. But, yeah. um, but having said all of that, you kind of said both things, but I'm getting the idea. You correct me if I'm wrong, that you're tending more toward the latter side, that this was human error. Well, I would sort of straddle the fence on those. I, you know, did, did Brigham Young believe that he was, well, let me answer it with a story because I think there is this room for, if those are two, I don't think those are mutually exclusive, I guess is how I'd answer that. As a missionary, I met a, a gentleman who was a patriarch in, in Montevideo, Uruguay, and he was the first missionary called from Uruguay, actually, uh, in the church. And he ended up being a patriarch. And in about 1977, uh, he gave a patriarchal blessing to an, a young man who was of African descent, so African Uruguayan uh, young man. And he felt prompted and blessed this young man that he would receive the priesthood. And he said, he, he, I'll never forget him telling the story uh, in his home. He, he looked at me and said, you know, I, I almost pulled my hands up, but I said, I felt that prompting so strongly that uh, I, I had to say it. And then I called Salt Lake uh, the next day and, and just didn't get any sort of response for days. And, and he said, but I'm not going to go back on it. And so I guess so. that's why I, I see those kinds of experiences where there are individuals who are guided by the Savior in that manner. And so maybe there's, there, there's some sort of middle ground on, on that where God had to work through the social mores or, or norms of those people again i feel like i'm copping out on this one too I'm you are sorry, totally <laughs> it's okay this is being this is being a big cop out tonight I'm because so <laughs> because elder oaks now president oaks has gone on record as saying this was all god's doing it was god 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 all the way along the line and the, the problem that i have is that this is obviously a racist uh, teaching a racist practice because it's a, a practice of excluding people from the priesthood and from a certain buildings, by the way, from temples yeah. based yeah. upon their race. Um, and it seems to me that the 
the conclusions that we can reach are pretty limited. Either leaders of the church who instituted the policy and continued it were racist or God was. And when it's put that starkly, it's pretty easy for me to decide I need to come down on the answer that doesn't have God being a racist. Okay. What do you think? Well, I, I think that's a fair statement. I, I would not, because I don't believe God is racist. I do believe God does things that we don't understand, but I don't believe God in the scriptures are replete with examples where God does not look on skin color or the outward appearance and all of that. So yes, I, I guess that here's where the nuance comes in that you asked about earlier, right? Yes. <laughs> I, I sort of have a nuanced view on that, but I respect and understand what, what that you would come on the side that it's completely a mistake of, 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 the, of the church leaders. Okay. We're going to go down to, did quick? you want to say something, Bill? Go ahead. Please. Yeah. So it seemed like at the beginning of that, of, of you commenting there that mm -hmm. you were about to say that there's possibility that Brigham Young thought he received a relation. True. Do you is that in the possibilities in your head of what could have happened? Well, I painted myself in a corner on that one, didn't I? I know because because you know where the follow up <laughs> question is going to go, which is oh yeah, I do. If, if that's possible, <laughs> and then prophets one after the other maintain it, then it brings every revelation into question and their ability to discern truth from error. You're exactly right. I I. Uh... I'm going to backtrack on that, <laughs> but no, to, to, to be fair, Bill, I appreciate you sort of catching that detail. Um, and I understand that the, the slippery slope that that gets us all into those of us who profess a, a belief in prophetic calls, right? That if, if we can't trust our prophet's ability to receive revelation, then what do we have to stand on? You know, why are we even here? And so I appreciate you catching, catching that. And you might, um... You take another issue with the LGBT policy. The church puts a policy in place in 2015, and then it retracts it three and a half years later, and they claim that both of those were by revelation. But that, that really doesn't make any rational, logical sense at all. Why would God do something only to reverse his opinion three and a half years later? And, and so it seems like there's a struggle on the part of leaders to admit these grew up. Again, back to your conversation earlier about fallibility and infallibility, it feels we all ought to just shine the light on it and say, hey, sometimes we make really serious mistakes and we screw up doctrine and theology for years and sometimes decades on end. You know, that's a, that's a great point, just philosophically that you make at the end. You know, why... And I don't, and I don't have a good, that's a good question to consider. Why, why can't we admit those things if, if, you know, if, the, if those are what happens, you know, Joseph Smith was very public in admitting his shortcomings, uh, you know, as far as in the Doctrine of Covenants, you know, the, the last 116 pages, right? I mean, he, he admitted when he did something wrong like that. Uh, and that's a fair question. Why, why can't, is it? And I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I don't really, you know, I've thought about the policy change a lot and I've listened to, to, to the two of you talk about that. And I, I know RFM did a, a podcast on that uh, a while back and I did listen to that one. Um, and that's, that's another thing that what, what allowance, and it goes back to your point earlier, Bill, about what allowance can we confidently give our, our leaders who, who are, who we should sustain or, or we, we believe, you know, claim to sustain as prophets, seers and revelators. And, and I guess to, to RFM's point earlier about the nuance of way I, I look at things, I, I guess, I guess uh, that's a good question. And I don't have a good answer. You know, is it a, a, that's one that is also sort of a sticking, you know, why, why the reversal, you know, did, did uh, the council recognize that they'd made a mistake? Why didn't they just say, hey, you know, we recognize that this wasn't interpreted or, or conveyed as, as was intended? That's a good one. I don't, have a, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a good answer for you, Bill. I feel like I'm letting your whole audience down here. No, I, <laughs> I don't think you're letting anybody down. I appreciate your vulnerability and acknowledging that all of this is messy and complex and doesn't have good answers. Maybe in a lot of places. And, and I guess I've, what I fall back on, and I appreciate you, you recognize, you're, 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 I think I 
courteous of the garble, just the idea of, of messiness. Part of the way I look at God's relationship to us, and, and maybe this is because my mom's a convert, my, my wife's a convert after being a complete atheist for most of her growing up. Um, and again, my wife is is up there with the most charitable. She, she has more integrity and genuineness than I ever could. Uh, you know, if, 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 if it were so easy to have faith, then we wouldn't have the agency to choose to believe. And I know I don't want to sound like uh, the cop out apologist, right? You guys have talked about that too, right? There's this you know, trump card that apologists can play. And I'm not trying to play a trump card. I don't think that's a trump card because I don't want to minimize the real concerns and the real messiness that's out there. Uh, I guess I look at it and I think to, you know, I, I'm a software developer by day. And so if, if, the, if life were like a, a software program without any bugs, and it just runs perfectly every single time. Um, then there's no there's no effort to solve the problem. But if you if life is like a software program that has bugs that you have to resolve and you have to work through and you have to struggle, then I think that's a better life that we have to figure out. And and I would not I I don't I don't uh, criticize people or I don't feel that people are are less worthy or anything if they have questions and, and can't resolve them in their heads, uh, I, I guess the way others do. And so I, thank you for that. Uh, ben, I don't, I don't mean to be super critical here. He said right before saying something. So <laughs> no, no, no. But it, it does sound to me like the way you're resolving this particular issue is by not resolving it. Is that fair? Yeah, that that's I have I have faith. I choose to have faith that God understand that that His ways are not my ways, uh, and and I there are some things that I don't understand, and I'm going to add it to my checklist of questions for when I get that interview with Him one of these days. Hopefully, yes. not for fifty years, but <laughs> God's ways are not your ways because you're not a racist polygamist. Well, that's a little harsh, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know i understand what you're saying and, and kind of uh i like the corner you're painting me into <laughs> no 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 and we're not really painting you into a corner these are issues and you brought it up yourself so yeah hoist it on your own petard there but seriously you're right. these are issues that i mean the corner's there yeah the church has put itself in this corner historically yeah. and if someone actually tries to deal with the issue then uh, they go down one road and they go, boy, that comes to a bad result. Let me back up. Let's go down this other road. Okay. And this idea is, okay, God's a racist. Okay, bad. No, no. Uh, well, if he's not a racist, then the, the prophets can't understand what revelation is and they're getting it wrong. And what else can we try? No, that's wrong. That's bad. Let's back up from there. And so then we just sort of, well, I call it whistling past the graveyard, which is trying to spend a lifetime not thinking about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Let's, not, let's not think about that. Let's be like Scarlett O'Hara. I'll think about that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And you can't just live with perpetual shelves, so to speak, the metaphorical shelves that get right. broken by from time to time. Uh, it, 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 I just, I just, I guess you're right. I, I don't, I don't tend to look at it with only two perspectives, like, like you've eloquently and fairly painted. Um, I feel like there's a middle ground somewhere and I don't think God's a racist or, you know, whatever, but I also think he has to work through people who are, uh, unfortunately. And, uh, that, that, you know, we have throughout human history, right? We've got all these examples of atrocities committed in the name of God, in the name of culture, in the name of whatever. And, and, I think, you know, you look at that without a faithful perspective and of course, yeah, how could God exist at all, right? Mm -hmm. How could he allow these things to happen? I've heard that a lot. And that was my wife's, one of my wife's sort of frustrations. Like I can't, con you know, she couldn't conceive of someone who, like a God who would allow these things to happen or was, you know, soup, you know uh, who, who could conceive of the universe is too big. Human suffering is too great. Uh, and I think those are legitimate concerns and and we have to uh we have to come to grips with somehow a, a faithful perspective and, and again i go back to the experiences i've had the 
the homework I've done and the conclusions that I've reached that, that, that continually perpetuate my, my faith while acknowledging the, the messiness. Uh, and, I, and, and you and I have talked to our that I would hope that we can have dial, more dialogue like this, where, where there is a space for people both in and out or, or on their way out or on their way back or whoever uh, can have these kinds of conversations and hopefully strengthen one another and, and, and recognize that, acknowledge that um, not everything is, is, is as neat and tight as we'd like it to be. And, and hopefully, you know, you, you and I talked about this, that, that this, one of my goals of coming on the show is to hopefully foster some sort of dialogue like that and, and show that it can happen. Yes. And I appreciate your coming on. You're getting lots of very, very positive comments. When you go back and look at the chat, I think you're going to be quite impressed by the views of our listenership vis-a-vis -vis you. But, hey, we've got to get, uh, man. Yeah. We've been going. I'm so sorry. I do get off on tangents, but I think they're interesting tangents. Uh, but we have to get number three. What's three positive for you? The third positive thing, then we'll get to the book of Abraham. Yeah, I think um, the gospel culture, and I know that sounds bad because the church culture, I think, is separate. And I go back to what Patrick Mason has said and written and what I believe, you know, President Uchtdorf has talked about. This idea of community, we're supposed to, we are taught to love and serve others above self, to reach out to those in need. We're, we're taught to be united, to raise everyone around us out of poverty. Uh, you, you know, there's a line from one of my favorite TV shows uh, that says, the more you share, the more your bull will be plentiful, right? Um, to me, that's what, that's what discipleship is about, is about reaching out to our neighbor, about to those who are less fortunate to, 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 to lift people up. Uh, to befriend those, you know, the, the even the structure of, of, of wards. Terrell Givens is called this the sociological genius of Mormonism, where we're, we're in a ward and we have an opportunity to interact with people, at least in my geography, right, that are of different ethnicity and different socioeconomic situations and an opportunity to, to interact with them and, and, and people we might not hang out with on weekends, right? We have an opportunity to learn to love those who may not be as homogeneous as we are. And then I recognize that there are areas in the world where there is a lot of homogeneousness in wards. So I, I get that. But the bottom line, right, is that the, the community that the gospel culture, I think, is designed to create uh, is one of, of harmony and inclusiveness and tolerance and uh, helping each other. Unfortunately, as we've talked about, and this is one of my negative aspects, is you, this, the, the church culture, right? It doesn't always work as well as it should. And so we do have so the things we've already talked about, and I won't belabor that, just some of the judgmentalism, some of the comparisons and the feelings of guilt, the feelings of inadequacy. I feel like if we really understood what the Savior has offered us, then we wouldn't feel that those feelings of guilt. And unfortunately, we do it to ourselves. We're our own worst enemy sometimes. And, and so that's one of the reasons why it's been this pet topic of mine of, of mine over the years is you know pick something that annoys you about somebody and don't be annoyed you know <laughs> look around and and lift people up even if you disagree with them on whatever you know the pandemic of course is has polarized so many people it shouldn't uh, we should be able to look past our differences and, and I believe that's what the gospel culture is designed to create and I, I love that about the gospel culture. Um, unfortunately, again, we live in a mortal world and we're not there yet. We got a long way to go. I hear you uh, making a distinction between gospel culture and church culture. I, and I, I say that, yeah, the gospel in my mind is the ideal. What, what, uh, and then, you know, with anything, the church comprised of members, you know, us, it was it Henry Byring's father that said that the Lord had a perfect church until he let everybody in, you know, when, when all of us come in and we're, uh, rubbing each other the wrong way and trying to do the best we can and comparing, uh, you know, each other and comparing ourselves. We, to me, that's the church culture that, that, that is a result of imperfect people trying to strive for an ideal. And it just takes, uh, it takes a lot of effort there. Uh, so that's why I distinguish the two. I, I, I see the gospel culture as the ideal, but what the savior would like us to be like a Zion, uh, and I see the church culture as what we're struggling with and we're struggling through. And it's a challenge. Using those um, examples, let me tell you how I see it. 
Uh, what I see is I hear what you're saying about the gospel culture wanting to be inclusive, wanting to be um, equal and uh, learning to love and serve other people of different uh, racial, ethnic, um, financial status from us. Um, but it seems like the LDS church has this dang history of doing the opposite, whether it's the priesthood ban for 126 years, whether it's the policy of exclusion from November 5th, 2015, about saying that, you know, people with gay parents living in a gay relationship, you know, can't be blessed as a baby for crying out loud. Um, and that's just 2015. And it seems like people who are LGBTQ in the church are not being treated um, inclusively. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? I, yes, I think there have been great strides or great efforts made in the last, what, 10, 10, 15 years, but you're right. Uh, I, I think that that stems from, uh, um, I, I cut you off. Did you have, go ahead. I, well, I no, that's so. okay. Um, if you want to share your thought, you go ahead. But mainly what I'm, I'm suggesting is it seems like what you're saying sounds really nice and it sounds good in a uh, theoretical mm -hmm. sort of sense. But it just seems like pretty much everything the church has done throughout its history has been at odds with that. You know, I, I, I think part of that stems from just the roots of where we came from. Uh, you, you know, you can imagine you know, the saints are persecuted and they're kicked out and they're moved uh, New York to Kirtland to Missouri to Nauvoo. And, and then they go away from the country, right? They're outside of the U.S. and, and Utah. And, and, and there's this sort of us against the world mentality that I think was fostered maybe out of necessity. Uh, I, I wasn't there. I can't. This is me speculating right after doing a bunch of homework on the issue. But I, I see some of those roots. It was you know, those, that, that idea and that attitude may be passed down uh, where we have, there's this distinction and, you know, President Hinckley was maybe the first, uh, well, well, you know, that's alluded to, I guess, in, in, in David McKay's book, the one we alluded to earlier, but the idea of, of, you know, being part of a global culture, a global ideal, a global community of faith and, and those kinds of things. And so I see what you're saying where there is this policy, the policies that have been what you've called policies of exclusion but did it come from the, this idea of being persecuted so long that we're, we become this social group that that goes feel, home after a bad day of work and kicks a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <laughs> anyway, anyway, I, I, you know, I, I, I do think, you know, I, I do, you know, I think of some of the talks that I've, I've heard at general conference and president Uchtdorf, we've talked a lot about, you know, I, I, I love, uh, I know Elder Holland is a lightning rod for, for some of your podcasts, but you know, his, his talk, the other prodigal given several years ago about the idea of not being self-righteous, I think was a landmark in my mind. Uh, oh, and I don't know why these, these ideas and these principles don't have a lasting effect. And it, you're right. There have been policies that have been exclusive. Does it stem from our history? And I, I don't know how, how, did, how did that culture get molded and, and how do we get away from it? I, I wonder if, the, the church culture that you were talking about is more Intermountain West and, and Western U.S. Do, do, the, do we have these same issues and these same concerns in Africa or uh, Europe or South America? You know, I, I, I didn't see the same things in South America that I see in church culture here. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it's limited. And I just want to finish that off by saying that from my perspective, this exclusion continues even up to the present day in the LDS church. Uh, by their policy that it's fine that now if you're homosexual and you're a member of the church, you just have to live a life of complete celibacy. And that seems to be not inclusive to me. Yeah, when you put it that way, I can I can see how you would identify that as exclusive because you're excluding people from uh, a marital or an intimate relationship. Yeah. Okay, so your last thing, I'm so sorry this is taking so long, but I think people are really enjoying it. I hope people are really enjoying it. I know I'm enjoying it. Uh, your third then difficult thing with the church was the book of Abraham that you had written out. What is it about the book of Abraham that you find problematic? Yeah, the book of Abraham is, is sort of a, I see great things in it and I see just troubling aspects. And I, I listened to part of your podcast with Robert Rittner and I'm aware of all the difficulties and 
And I think you and uh, Billy and RFM, I think both of you did a pod, couple of podcasts together about the Book of Abraham, as I recall. I didn't listen to all of it with Rip Rittner. That was a long one. 13 hours. <laughs> point, point being is the production of the Book of Abraham, you know, uh, can be problematic from a perspective of uh, this is what I expect from a, someone who claims to be translating from hieroglyphs. And, you know, I, I read Terrell Given's book, uh, The Pearl of Greatest Price. Um, and one of the, you know, he, he, he kind of goes through in that book about, you know, the different uh, theories or way to resolve some of the concerns, you know, the different ways of looking at how it was produced. And so, you know, each one of those theories has pros and cons, and, and I don't think we need to go through all of them here. You've done that very well. Uh, but so, so I guess <clears throat> I, I don't know that it's on the list of troubling things that we've talked about. This is sort of mm -hmm. down for me because what I do appreciate in the book of Abraham is, are the doctrines. And Terrell Givens talks a lot about that about the in that book, just the idea of the doctrines and the plan of salvation that is revealed in those books. And, and I find a lot of really inspiring content. And so, you know, do I, 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 I guess my, my choice to believe in, in, in uh, sustain the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints uh, doesn't hinge on a narrow interpretation of how the book of Abraham was supposed to have been produced. Uh, so I, I don't know much more to say about that. I think you guys have dealt with it a ton and, and probably, you know, and the evening's getting late minutes. and everybody has been just dying. I know to hear the answer to the question that forms the title of this episode, <laughs> because I understand that radio free Mormon is a subject that is brought up from time to time in state presidency meetings. Is that correct? Yes or no? You have been brought up. Yes. Okay. So, the $64 question now, President McKay, is why hasn't RFM been excommunicated yet? You you mean why hasn't there a why hasn't a membership council been held? Right. <laughs> why hasn't RFM had his ass kicked out of the church? Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, let, let me preface, and I can't remember when we're ending, but I don't want to take too much time. First of all, obviously, I don't speak for the church. I don't speak for our stake. I don't speak for our stake president. And you've met our stake president. He's a I have a ton of respect for him. He, I, I, I believe he's an inspired leader. Uh, I've worked with him closely for four years, and he's a, a genuinely good guy. He takes his responsibilities. He approaches them with a, a humble uh, dedication that I admire without taking himself too seriously. Uh, and I love that about him. Uh, we have talked over the last four years a, a handful of times about uh, this issue. Uh, and, and by the way, Ben, if you can... Yeah. I have talked in a prior podcast, mm -hmm. it was like a year and a half ago, about my meeting with the state president back in October of 2017. So that's going on four years ago, but that's the only meeting and communication I've had with the state president. And he wanted me to meet in his office. I said, okay, but I asked that you be there yeah. since you were the one conveying the <clears throat> invitation to me. Yeah. And you showed up. Could you tell the audience your perception of the meeting, which is like an hour and a half long? I think the state president finally had to shut it down because he wanted to go home and I was getting long winded. <laughs> but uh, your your perception of the meeting, since you were there for it, and then take it on from there as to any discussions about me and ultimately why it is that I have not had a membership council. My perception, and, and please you know, correct me if with your perception recollection, my perception is we had a, f a fun, friendly, uh, positive conversation. Uh, I think he wanted to get to know you a little bit and understand where you're coming from. Uh, you made it very clear that your goal is not to drag people out of the church. So you, your goal is to present evidence and, and facts as you see them. I have appreciated that about your presentations as far as uh, you, and you and I've talked, there's a sort of a line, right, that, that people can cross where uh, you become someone who's advocating a certain perspective. And, and, I, and you may, you've maintained that, that you're trying to present ideas and so forth and let people decide for themselves. I think we came away from that conversation, I thought, in a positive way. Uh, I think he felt the same way that your goal, I think he felt satisfied that you're not trying to tear down church leaders you're not you know full of ad hominem attacks you know on on those individuals i mean you, i don't say liar liar pants on fire well there's sometimes you i think for shock value you may say a few things you know, <laughs> no like, no i don't say that that's bills. <laughs> oh that's, that's bill bills. okay <laughs> that's what got him asked okay right 
<laughs> oh, but I, I do know you little, oh, like a little shock value every once in a while. Um, so, so kind of from there, right? You and I had a couple follow up conver- or maybe one follow up conversation, and, and I appreciated you taking the time with just me in there. And I think our state president, RFM, uh, recognizes that Keith and I are, are, are friends of yours, and we um, sort of maintain a relationship and, and, and always will, regardless of whatever happens, right? Uh, and, uh, and frankly, there have been so many things that we've had to deal with as a stake, especially with the pandemic and, and, and trying to reach out and minister to those who are struggling that we haven't brought it back up, you know, several months ago, someone pointed something out to him and he, you know, we talked a little bit, but never in the sense of he, he, frankly, the the real reason is he just hasn't felt at, to this point directed to do so. And, and, you know, it's not, has nothing to do with the fact you're an attorney. It has nothing to do that we're afraid of talking with you. You know, it's, uh, you know, there, there are only a few things. Well, there's a list of things in the handbook. Everyone can go read it for which a membership council is mandatory, right? Well, you know, apostasy, which is I'm sure what most of your audience thinks you would be removed for, uh, is not listed under those as one of those things. Um, one of those things that requires a, a mandatory membership council. And, uh, you know, and, and even possibly, I actually have the handbook pulled up here, but I won't, I won't take too much time. But the point being is that, you know, there are a few things that are, that I'm sure your audience would probably suggest that you're across the line. And maybe one of those is reported, you know, repeatedly acting in clear and deliberate public opposition to the church's doctrines, policies, or its leaders, or a pattern of intentionally working to weaken, weaken the faith and activity of church members. You know, those are the two things that some people might conclude that 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 uh, you would be that your actions might fall into those categories um i i tend to think and this is again me speaking i'm not speaking for the state president i i would love to see the church you know the, the if we're using the metaphor of the the tent of zion you know that, that can stretch as far as possible and i recognize that you know the purpose of a membership council it's not a trial it's not a court it's not designed to determine guilt the purpose is to counsel together and identify ways to help individuals and, and obviously protect others you know especially in cases of abuse those kinds of things the, the first pro- the first priority is to, to help protect others and having sat in several of those councils in the last 15 years i have been on a few that are difficult where uh, uh, someone did not feel that they were uh, that they had uh, committed what was being stated. And, and so I, I have participated in some of the difficult ones. But point is, is that as of right now, <laughs> as of what, 6.57 Pacific time, <laughs> that's that's why uh, it just hasn't been something. And, and, and I would, that, that the state president has felt to do. Uh, and, and you do, you know, RFM, you and I have talked about this before, right? That uh, I think you would agree with me that you try not to cross that line of advocating that people leave the church. Uh, and I don't think that you uh, cross the line where you're repeatedly criticizing and tearing down church leaders. I think you present facts and, and evidence and so forth. So that's my take. I, I hope that's not, not a disappointing answer. Uh Things, you know, I, I can't predict the future, um, but whatever happens, right, uh, you know this and, you know, Keith and I and always will always be uh, friends of yours. And, and I hope that regardless of what may or may not happen, which I don't, I can't predict the future, obviously, that, that you would know that we ha- have, have friendship with you and that won't change whatever happens. Well, I appreciate that. Don't worry about not being able to predict the future. President Nelson can't either. <laughs> I'm sorry. That okay. But, but anyway, thank you very much. But there have been some people who have called the state president hotline to complain about me. There, I think more, more just an email. Hey, have you read this pod or listened to this podcast or something? I, I don't know the details. He hasn't shared those with me. Just, Hey, you know, I heard RFM said this and I'm like, yeah, well, let's go listen to it. And to, to be fair, uh, you're an interesting case, RFM, right? Because you you have there have been some things that you have shared with me and written and published that have strengthened my testimony in the church's truth claims, right? And so you're sort of this 
this uh, interesting paradox uh, where where some of the things you th some of the things that you talk about, I think, are valid criticisms of, of 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 church culture and so forth, right? And some of the things that you've written in the past do strengthen faith. Um, and so it's it's complex. It's not, I don't think it's as easy as people in your audience might think, right? Okay. Uh, Very good. Well, I tell you what, I appreciate your coming on. I know Bill is having a, a dickens of a time. Oh, with the new setup from his house. So, um, but I hope that A, he can hear me and B, we can do the technology to allow some listeners to call in. We've gone a little bit long, but I would like to allow some people a chance to talk to you personally and ask you any questions if that's okay with you. Yeah. Again. yeah. Bill, are you there? He may be gone. He may be trying to log out, log in, shut down, reboot. <laughs> But um, so let's go ahead and let's see if uh, he'll come back on here any second, because I'm basically out of things to talk with you about. How well, let wonderful. Me, let, let me just, uh, you know, I, I appreciate to the tolerance of your audience. You know, I'm not a subject matter expert on anything, but, but I have enjoyed the dialogue. And I hope, I hope that we can exemplify the kind of dialogue that I hope your audience would uh, appreciate, right? And hopefully that they can encounter uh, members of, of the church who are still in, uh, who, who would have those dialogues and be respectful and loving. I, I hope that I would like to think that, that they will encounter those kinds of people. And that's my hope. I, I, I don't want to, um, it, it saddens me when people like, like your experience, right. Where you felt a little ostracized and heard the crickets that, that definitely saddens me. And I don't think that's the way it should be. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Although I do understand putting the, the shoes on the other foot, why people would be concerned about those who leave. The concern is, what did they find out that I don't know? And if I find it out, is it going to have the same effect on me? And God forbid that should happen. So better just to play it safe is, I think, probably how they feel. Besides which, uh, they really never liked me in the first place. <laughs> the only reason they had anything to do with me was because Mormonism, right? <laughs> so this was their excuse to get shut of me. Hey, Bill, are you there? Do we have? Oh, my Lord. So, so I'm here, but um, you guys keep disappearing off my screen. And I know that it's my connection. So I highly doubt this is going to work, but we can try. Okay. So we're going to try for phone calls. Yeah. Okay. We don't have enough time to have two days of fasting and prayer. No, we don't. And uh, it, it looks like it's not going to work on my end, RFM. It's not going to work? It's not, unfortunately. Can I ask you a question, Bill? Do you have access to the, the chat questions and everything? Um, somebody did ask, did you have, did you ask, and did you feel like you needed to ask permission to do this show tonight? I let my stake president know. Uh, there wasn't really a question that I asked. Uh, he knows that our, our, our stake president is, is not ignorant uh, of the issues out there. Uh, and he recognizes that my goal here was to try and 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 and, and build a bridge, right? And so, uh, I, I didn't ask, uh, but we I did let him know. Perfect, love that. Um, I'm going to try to let people kind of ask questions on the on the chat, which I think is going to be the easiest way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I'm just waiting. Has questions that you want to re-ask? that you may have asked before or ask any new question of President McKay. That has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? President McKay. <laughs> then- um, I still can't get used to that. It's just, it's just <laughs> fine. <laughs> well, people call you president all the time, don't they? Yeah, but you know what? I'm just a normal guy. <laughs> Somebody did ask, what, what did you think of Natasha Helfer Parker's excommunication? That's a great question. I, I read a lot about that. I. I, I, I want to be, I want to, I want to express myself accurately and not convey the wrong ideas here. Um, from the outside looking in, uh, it's, it's, one could be disappointed on how the, the, how it was handled, right? Not letting people in the building and not letting her in the building and all those sorts of things. I mean, the optics on that are not great. Having, having been through several of these councils, anyone who participates is in a no-win situation because we're, we're never going to share what goes on, right? To protect confidentiality and all those kinds of things. And, 
And so I, I recognize that there are two sides to the story, but I also, I, I, I would have hoped that it could have been handled differently. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to criticize the leaders, right? Because I wasn't there and I, and I don't understand the thought process they go there. But again, I like to think that using the rest handily in that. In that. But again, I'm not, I'm not says the leader is trying to recognize that things could have been done differently. You know, now you're having the same trouble that Bill was having, Ben. You're kind of freezing up and your voice is going kind of wonky. Oh. For all I know, my voice is doing that to you. How's my voice doing? I can hear you. Okay, because I was going to ask you, in what way do you wish it could have been handled differently? <laughs> at, at least allowing people who had traveled to enter the building and allowing uh, Natasha to uh, speak. As, as I understand, as I read from the reports, that she wasn't allowed to, to present her. She just wrote the letter and wasn't allowed. I, my, the details are fuzzy in my mind. I did read all the articles about it in the Salt Lake Tribune. I think what happened was had to do with the phone that she took in with her and saying she wanted to read notes off of her phone. They said, you can't have the phone with you. So she says, OK, bag the whole thing. That's my recollection. Yeah. I mean, there are ways to put phones in airplane mode. And I, I guess I, I work in the technology industry. So those th kinds of things seem easy to me. But yes. Um, <laughs> so I, I, those, those, are, those are details, right? That could have been done differently. Again, I wasn't there. I wasn't in the building. I don't know the conversations that happened. Right. All we're hearing is her side. And, and I, I respect her account, right? I'm not trying to call her dishonest or anything. But I also recognize that in these situations, there are always two sides. Mm hmm uh, Bill? Yeah, so there's a question there below. Does Ben think his stake is more liberal than normal? Politically? <laughs> um, inclusive to people um, and the reasons they maybe struggle with the church. Do you find that your stake leadership and maybe the stake in general is more uh, more liberal than conservative in that regard? Yeah, that's, that's a great clarification, Bill. And I, I was, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I do know, uh, so I can cite an anecdotally, right? The, the stakes that I'm familiar with, the stake my parents live in the heart of Utah County in Northeast Orem, Utah, is one of the most incredibly wonderful collection of people that, that I interact with. Uh, and, and I know that goes against what a lot of people think about Northeast Orem. Um, but they're, they're, uh, they're fantastic individuals. And so that's one anecdote that I have. Uh, I, I know one of my sisters would probably say that my stake is a little more liberal in that regard. Uh, she has experiences with well-meaning leaders that may not share some of her, she would call progressive views about gender and so forth. But um, but she also, uh, so, so I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder if, I would, I would hope that we're not abnormal. I would hope that we're not abnormal. Yeah. Do you, so the question there below, um, how do you feel about worthiness interviews with children? You know, I'm aware of Sam Young's uh, feelings and thoughts on the matter. Um, I'm going to be totally honest, and uh, this is not the answer that you might expect. I, I, I believe that there is value in interaction with youth uh, because of the experience I had as a bishop. Uh, I interact with some wonderful youth and in, in some of those conversations that were behind a closed door, obviously following all the policies or they could have walked out any time. They could have had an adult coming with them. Uh, there was always someone right outside. But there were some things shared in those those interviews that would not have been shared otherwise and, and conflicts that needed to be res resolved between youth and parent. And, and so I saw the benefit. I understand the concerns. I, I saw the benefit to have an adult mentor uh, who can be trusted uh, in that setting. Um, having having said that, I, I I understand the you know I understand the concerns, but I I still see the value in those interviews. I, I had some very spiritual conversations with youth who were really struggling with a variety of issues. Having said that, though, I followed I followed the handbook. I didn't ask questions I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> yeah. Should, should there be two leaders in those conversations? When the church initiates the interview, 
rather than the kid coming in to talk about something in his life, which I think a kid should be able to voice concerns uh, without and build a pick who he tells that to. Mm-hmm. In the instances where the church initiates the interview, should there always be two adults in the room? That's an interesting idea. You know, starting the interview with two adults there, and then if the youth feels like they want to talk to one of those individuals, then one of the well, one of the individuals can leave at the behest of the youth. I had I haven't. Con- it's a new idea. It's an innovative idea that I hadn't considered before. Uh, I think there could be value. Obviously, in in today's world, I think there could be a lot of value in it. Being a a, a coach of primarily high school age boys and girls. I interact a lot with that age group. And for sure, I follow all those kinds of policies. And I understand I have every year I have to go through that training, right? And so, Bill, that's a good idea. Honestly, if there's allowance for the for the youth to have a one-on-one, then that'd be a great idea to allow them to start with two adults in the room. You know, and, and maybe if it's a young woman, right? The young woman's leader or, or a trusted advisor with uh, uh, the, uh, the bishop, you know, so that there, I, I have participated in interviews like that where, where an individual wanted to bring a, a woman in. And of course, I allowed that to happen. Yeah, especially with the lay clergy, I think it's essential. Um, the question there below say you're the prophet, Ben, you get to make one change in the church. What would it be? Uh, no more suits and ties at church. <laughs> I don't. I, I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry. I don't think you are. Well, that, I'm not. <laughs> that's a cultural <laughs> thing. <laughs> you know that I'd have to think about that. I, that's a fair question, and and I don't presume to to know the mind of God. Um, boy, that's a tough one. Uh, prop. Pro, I. Uh, that's a good question. And I know I'm 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 stalling here, but just I don't have a, a good answer. Let me think about that for a second. And and forget trying to supersede the prophets. I don't want to put you in that yeah. place. Let's say that you and God get together and God says, whatever you want, I'll I'm I'm okay with it. Let's do it. And so it's it's simply direct line him to you. You're talking to him. He says you get to make one change in the church. It, it, it's not about putting the prophets in their place or anything. It's simply yeah. what thing, if you could make anything change, what would it be? You know, I think I would I would uh, go back to plural marriage and um, reinstituting it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're just removing it. Uh, I, I I see so much value in the partnership between a you know two individuals, a man and, and you know in my case, a man and a wife. Um, I, I see so much value in that. I, that resonates with me so much that I would love to say, hey, let's just pretend that never happened or it doesn't exist anymore. Because, you know, I, I could cite all sorts of policies, right, Bill? And, and, and I think there are lots of other these other things that could be corrected. And, and maybe maybe it would be, hey, let's have more of a direct line. You know, let's, you know, why don't you like friend me or something so, you know, we can get some more immediate guidance on the iPhone here. But uh, so, but, but for me personally, right. And only thinking of my world, um, not thinking globally, I guess that's a little self-centered of me. Uh, it would be that, but we don't practice plural marriage anymore, not temporarily. So what's your beef and what, why does it need a fix? I, I just, like I said, I, I, I would like to see, you know, you're sealed to, to one individual and, and that's, that's it. You, you're. Uh, there's no allow. I would not. I would love to see uh, you know. You're not a, uh, no allowance for uh, multiple spouses. I, I don't see the need for it, and I don't understand it. Like we talked about, and so, you know, two individuals like my my great grandmother is a, a great example of this. She, her husband died, and uh, she married someone who was a widower, and and they had a you know last 15 years together of their lives in their 80s. They had companionship and fellowship, but you know they always understood. You know when they go to the next life, they're going to be with their original spouses, and that. That resonates me with me. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to do here, Arf? Am I, I, it seems like everybody is essentially appreciative, Ben, of you coming on and being willing to have this conversation. So many people in the church aren't. Um, and, you know, there's criticism in the comments too, but I think overwhelmingly everybody's appreciative of how kind you are and your willingness to be here. 
Well, I appreciate that. And I, and I fully recognize that I, you know, there aren't easy answers to a lot of these things. And, and, and I hope I didn't come across trying to convince people that they were, but I hope, like you said, I hope that, um, people know that w there are, are many of us who are willing to have the dialogue and, and I respect your audience and hope I didn't bore them to death. <laughs> oh no, I think this has been hugely popular. Um, but I'm just guessing cause I can't yeah. see any numbers it, up here, but it, I think so. Yeah, it was, it was like 480 people watching at some point and that's on the higher end of what we get for the live part of it. Yeah. So let me just say a couple things. First off, thank you. You are awesome. You're the tops. Thank you. You're the Mona Lisa. Very kind of, kind of you. No, you're great. And I'm so great that you came on. We have been working on this for what, over a year, I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, finally to get you on because he's very, very busy with all of his activities and his full time job and his being a member of the state presidency. And so, yeah, very, very busy. Um, so thank you for coming on. And the other thing that I wanted to say was the one change that uh, the second change I think you need to have, make in the church. I want you to consider RFM for president. There you go. Will you do that? I'll, I'll think about it. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I think well, that would be a lot of fun. And it would um, be. yes, and you could be my first counselor then. That sounds great. We'll we'll, we'll talk it over lunch. We'll no more lunch second counselor for you. That's going to be all in the past. <laughs> no, it was so great to have you come on. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you as a human being and as a friend. Yeah, I appreciate you as a friend too. And Bill, it's been great to talk with you. And I just appreciate the the, the courtesy and the uh, just the the kindness of the dialogue, the respectfulness. I really appreciate that from you too. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, that, that just reminded me of the other thing, the, the actual thing I meant to say, <laughs> and I got distracted with RFM for president, is um, no, uh, you are absolutely right. And I think I've been pretty consistent. Actually, I think mm -hmm. I'm absolutely consistent in this. Is that no, my goal is not to convert anybody to any thing. OK, because Mormonism were great for me for the first part of my membership in the church. It started working less well for me as time went on. But, you know, I would be a liar if I didn't say, hey, it worked for me when mm -hmm. I was a late teenager, when I joined the church and in, in my 20s. And I, I know from talking with Bill and he's uh, talked about this publicly, too, that joining the LDS church back when he was a late teenager really, really was a positive impact on his life and the structure and getting him out of doing certain things that he was going down paths that might have led to very negative repercussions. And there I'm talking about, you know, selling the drugs in school, right, Bill? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. The statute of limitations has run on that. No, we're good. Let's go ahead and admit it. Let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> so very, very positive. So yeah. uh, I think that the church, this church can work for lots of people. Mm -hmm. And if it does, I think that's great. And if it doesn't, I think that's fine too. I have no judgment on that, except to hold open the reality for me, which is that no, the church is not an unvarnished evil anymore, yeah. that it's an unvarnished good. And it has good things for people. You're a good person. You are an active member and a faithful member, though mm -hmm. perhaps nuanced, unorthodox was your word. Um, but, you know, obviously, yeah. obviously that uh, the church can have such quality people as you who are uh, observant members. So that speaks a lot to the value of the church, just you, as well as other people like you in my own experience. So, no, I'm not trying to get people to uh, follow me. I don't think that I'm necessarily a person that anybody should be following. And if they knew about my life, they would never want to follow me. <laughs> believe me. So, yeah. uh, but anyway, so that part is, is very clear, I think. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that you understand that. I'm glad that the state president understands that. I'm just underscoring this here to make sure that when he watches this, if he gets to the end, he'll see me saying this once again, and we can put in abeyance that membership council, <laughs> kick that can down the road a little bit further. Yes. Awesome. Well, appreciate your time tonight, Ben. Did you know, Ben, that Boyd K. Packer was a huge fan of the show? I, I've heard the, I've heard the exit. Yeah. Mormonism live. <laughs> Better than touching your own little factory. Yeah.